We're here today with Brother Michael Diamond to review some of the research that you've been doing over the last year. Research on creation, supernatural miracles, and the Shroud of Turin, just to name a few. Can you tell us some more about your research, Brother? I've tried to go through everything I could on the subjects we're going to be speaking about today. Creation, evolution, a young earth, the flood, the Shroud of Turin, miracles, and it would take I don't know how many hours to present all the information I have, and so therefore we're going to have to move very quickly through this information, touching upon what I feel is the most interesting of the information that I have. Now one thing people have to realize is that this is not science versus religion. This is religion versus religion. Evolution is nothing more than a pagan religion. There's no scientific proof for it whatsoever, as you're going to see in this tape. And it's a very dangerous theory because what you believe determines how you are going to behave. And evolution has created people like Lenin, Stalin, Hitler. Karl Marx dedicated his book, Des Kapital, to Charles Darwin. And it will continue to create these kinds of people. In fact, atheistic evolution is the official creed of all communists and atheists and a necessary basis for atheism. So people believe in the theory of evolution because of their lifestyle. They don't want there to be a god. They have these so-called missing links because they say that we evolved from an ape, but they've only been able to produce a couple of these when they should have millions of them. Lucy is the most complete so-called missing link. It was found by Donald Johansson in 1974. The leg bones for Lucy were found a mile and a half away from the head bones. And the leg bones were 200 feet deeper in a different layer of strata. They were not all found in the same layer of strata or even in the same location. They were scattered over a mile and a half. And all these supposed missing links have all turned out to be either fully human, fully animal, or fake. And just because some animals have some similar features doesn't necessarily mean a common ancestor. It may mean a common designer. Colin Patterson, he's an evolutionist, senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History. They have the largest collection of fossils in the whole world. And he wrote a book supporting evolution, and someone asked him why he didn't include any missing links in his book. And he responded to this letter. He said, quote, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I know of any, fossil or living, I would have certainly included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. So there's no missing links. There are trillions of fossils that you can study, but there are no missing links, and there has to be if evolution is true. DMS Watson said, quote, the theory of evolution is a theory universally accepted not because it can be proven true, but because the alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. You see, a watch demands a watchmaker, a design demands a designer, and a creation demands a creator. And they have all these organs uh, now. You mean vestigial organs, right? Right. They, they originally had 200 of these organs, now been reduced to a, a handful. One of the most common examples, they say, of evolution is the peppered moth of England. And there you had 95% light moss and 5% black moss. And what happened was you had the factories, they started burning coals, and the trees started turning black from the soot. So they counted the moss again. And now they had 95% black moss and 5% white. And so basically all that happened was the white moth lost its camouflage and, and was eaten. That's all that happened. And that is a sign of microevolution, which are minor changes in the structure and function of a plant and animal. And macroevolution is something completely different. And it's the teaching that one kind evolves into another. And this has never been proven by science. And basically, the key teaching of evolution is that life comes from non-living matter, spontaneous generation. But there's tremendous complexity in life in, in our bodies. For example, we have 50 trillion cells in our bodies. Carl Sagan said that in the simplest cell we know anything about, we have information equivalent to 100 million pages of Encyclopedia Britannica. And in the cell, everything is independent and codependent on everything else. A Cray computer can do 6 billion calculations per second. Estimates are that the little honeybee has to do a trillion calculations per second in order to fly. That means the little honeybee is 166 times faster than the Cray computer. And the honeybee can heal itself. and. But the conclusion of evolutionists is the computer, of course, is designed, but the honeybee evolved. People ask why the stars are so far away. Very simple, God put the stars very far away. That doesn't prove evolution whatsoever. People talk about alien life forms, uh, extraterrestrial life forms. 
Well, conditions outside the Earth are far more destructive than probably anyone suspected before space exploration began. Deadly radiation, poisonous gases, extreme gravitational forces, gigantic explosions, and the absence of the proper atmosphere and specific chemical elements. Just the temperature extremes in outer space would make almost any kind of life either so hot that it would vaporize or so cold that it would be completely rigid, brittle, and dead. And many of these space alien civilizations should have technology at least superior to ours and would have colonized our whole solar system, at least with mechanical robots. And they say everything started from a big bang 20 billion years ago. But in physics, there's a law called the conservation of angular momentum, which says that if you had the big bang that exploded everything, everything should be traveling in the same direction. But we've got all nine planets spinning counterclockwise, and we have 60 moons, and 11 of them are spinning backwards. When we look at the Earth, the Earth is 7,900 miles from the north to south pole. It's the exact right size to accept the exact right amount of energy from the sun, and it is exact distance from the sun to give us the perfect temperature. And we could go into hundreds of examples and how precisely balanced the Earth is. And if you change these, parameters by several percent, in some cases even a tenth of a percent, we'd either freeze to death or roast to death. And so basically the next question becomes, is the solar system and the Earth very young? And really, the evolution creation debate can be settled pretty quickly if you can prove the Earth is young. As the sun burns, it's losing five million tons per second, which means it's shrinking, which means it used to be heavier, which means that gravity was also stronger. So even 20 or 30 million years ago, the sun would be so big it would touch the Earth. Comets should only last 10 to 15,000 years before they're blown apart by the solar wind. Our calendars only go back to the year 4000 BC. How come they don't go back further than that? The population growth curve looked like it started about 4,500 years ago. Well, there was a flood about 4,400 years ago and eight people got off the ark. Another question is, how many billions of people should we have by this time? So where are all the people? At least, where are all the bones? The rings orbiting Saturn are being bombarded by comets, and they should be pulverized and dispersed in only about 10,000 years. Scientists admit that the oldest known living tree are the bristlecone pines of California and Nevada, which are 4,300 years old. How come we don't have an older tree? We have the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and after watching it for 20 years, they took a growth rate average, and they found out that the reef is 4,200 years old. But how come we don't have a reef that's older than that? When they drill down into the ground, they often hit oil, and this is often under tremendous pressure, sometimes as high as 20,000 pounds per square inch. And the scientists say that the pressure should have leaked off in about 10 to 15,000 years. But why is it still under pressure if the Earth is so old? The Earth's magnetic field cannot be any older than 10,000 years, otherwise it would be too strong for life to be comfortable on Earth. The second law of thermodynamics, it's called the law of entropy, which says that anything left to itself gets worse. Things left to itself don't get better, they get worse. And the moon is also getting further and further away from the Earth, which means it used to be closer. And there's a law called the inverse square law, which says that if you half the distance, you quadruple the attraction. So even a couple million years ago, the moon would be so close to the Earth that it would cause tides, it would flood the Earth twice a day. Dinosaurs, they say dinosaurs were around, I don't know how many millions of years they're saying, but they found DNA and blood cells in dinosaurs, and blood cells can only last for thousands of years, not millions of years. In Job chapter 40, verse 15, God says, Behold Behemoth, who has a tail like a cedar. And so I think that that might mean that was a dinosaur. And in New Zealand, there's a place called the Chatham Rise, and the Japanese come down there to fish a lot, and they pulled up this 4,000-pound, 32-foot skeleton of a dinosaur. And basically, lizards never stop growing. And so if you put them in a pre-flood environment with a water canopy, a lot more oxygen, eight or 900 years to live, a perfect food supply, no enemies, you've got yourself a dinosaur. In fact, before 1841, dinosaurs were called dragons, and the word dinosaur means a terrible lizard. Then people ask, is there any evidence for the worldwide flood or what caused it? And basically, uh, Genesis 7, 11, and 12 says, quote, In the 600th year in the life of Noah, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the floodgates of heaven were open. And you had a lot of subterranean water that this crack formed uh, around the earth. This is called the hydroplate theory. And there's a crack, it's called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge, that wraps around the Earth like the seam of a baseball. 
And what happened is the water exploded violently from out of that crack and caused most of the fossil record. That's called the hydroplate theory. They talk about the geologic column, how that proves evolution. In the textbooks, they have the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, all these different layers they say are millions of years old. Well, if you get a jar of dirt, shake it up, it will settle out into layers for you. It's called hydrolotic sorting. And so people have seen trees in the sediments going through all these different sediments that they say are millions of years old. And so there's only two explanations for this. One, either the trees grew in the sediments, or two, the sediment came down on top of the trees, and many of these trees are upside down. So all these layers, I believe, were caused from the worldwide flood. In fact, the Grand Canyon, they say that the Grand Canyon had gradually been eroded by the Colorado River. But if that's true, there should be a thousand cubic miles of sediment at the river mouth. And you go to the river mouth, and it's not there. And after the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, 600 feet of strata were deposited. And in one day, it formed a canyon system, 1 40th the scale of Grand Canyon. So these things were formed very rapidly and not over a long period of time. Evolutionists date the layers of rock by the fossils they contain, and then they date the fossils by the layers of rock that they're in. And this is circular reasoning. And fossils don't simply form when plants or animals simply dot and rot away. To become fossilized, a plant or animal must usually have hard parts such as bone, shell, or wood. It must be quickly buried to prevent decay and must be undisturbed throughout the long process. And the fossil evidence for a worldwide flood catastrophe is everywhere. It's very evident. And fish have been found by the billions with fins extended and eyes bulging. They found mammoths with the last meal perfectly preserved in their stomachs, and that kind of food isn't even found in that area today. They found whales that are buried straight up and down. They found fish fossilized, giving birth to their babies. They found clams that are petrified, and they're found closed. And when a clam dies, it opens up. The Bible says that all the mountaintops during the flood were submerged underwater. And Edmund Hillary, in 1953, he climbed Mount Everest. And when he reached a 26,000 foot level, for the next 3,000 feet, he found seashells and clams all over the place. So how do you get seashells on every major mountain range only if the worldwide flood really happened? Some people believe Noah's Ark is on the top of Mount Ararat in Turkey. What's interesting is on Mount Ararat itself, they found pillow lava, which is a unique formation that occurs only when molten lava emerges from the earth below water. And they've also found salt crystals on Mount Ararat, which could only be formed underwater. Is there any written evidence for a worldwide flood? Well, the flood account is found on Babylonian, Akkadian, and Sumerian cuneiform tablets, and these all date back to about 700 BC. In fact, a study of universal flood traditions reveals that there are over 200 accounts in every civilization and culture around the world, including the Inca and Aztec cultures. The size of the ark, they took a model of the ark and they tested in marine laboratories and they duplicated 200 foot tidal waves and they found that the ark was not only seaworthy but extraordinarily stable and during World War II the USS New Mexico and Oregon were built on the same proportions as Noah's ark, six times longer than it is wide. And someone says that how could you get all the animals on the ark and well first of all you take the very smallest animals. Dr. Kenneth Ebell, professor of biology, says, quote, each family of creatures on Earth have a single pair of ancestors. He says there are over 300 varieties of dogs in the world today, but they all have a single common ancestor. And he says that there would have been ample room to load ancestors of all the species we know of today with room left over for Noah's family, food, and supply. And due to the darkness, due to the storm above, the animals would probably eat less, sleep more, and be in a state of hibernation. Many hundreds of people have claimed to see the Noah's Ark on top of Mount Ararat. One man was Fernand Navarra, a French demolition expert, and he brought back wood that he claimed is from Mount Ararat. And the interesting thing is Mount Ararat is a totally treeless volcano peak, and they found that the wood he brought back doesn't grow near Mount Ararat. In fact, there's not a forest within 300 miles of the mountain. Jim Irwin took a very interesting picture when he was traveling with a Dutch TV crew. And they took this amazing photograph, and you can see to the left what they believe to be Noah's Ark. A French spot satellite identified a 200-foot piece of wooden object, 86 feet wide, extending over a crevasse, all this being under 60 feet of ice and snow. And so someone would say, how come someone just doesn't go on top of Mount Ararat and get the Ark? Well, the problem is that climbers have claimed that Mount Ararat is one of the hardest mountains to climb, maybe the hardest. And the ark is covered with ice, so you could walk right on top of it or over it and not know it's there. 
And when the Turkish government grants research permits, it's for the south side of Mount Ararat. Well, the Ark is believed to be on the north side. And people caught on the north side are usually arrested. And in the ongoing battle between the Turkish government and the soldiers there, 6,000 people have died on the slopes of Ararat during the 1990s. Many Bible stories are proving themselves to be true. The walls of Jericho, for example, the Bible says that those walls fell literally straight down. And they've examined these walls, and the walls are not pushed inward, but the walls fell straight down as if the earth opened up underneath them. They literally dropped. Sodom and Gomorrah, destroyed by God for homosexuality and other sins of the flesh. These are pictures of where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be located. Clearly, they look like cities. And they found that substances burned with sulfur or brimstone have a remaining ash that is heavier than the initial unburned substance. That is why probably these cities have been able to remain all these 3,900 years. And they found that these cities have been burned at four to 5,000 degrees. And the Bible tells us that it rained fire and brimstone upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you can go over there and you can see millions of chunks of little balls of sulfur all over the place. And if you look up the definition of the word brimstone in the dictionary, it means sulfur. God asked for the circumcision in Genesis 17 verses 10 through 12. He asked for the circumcision to be performed on the eighth day, not the fifth or the fourth day, but the eighth day. And they've only found recently that vitamin K, which clots the blood, is at its peak on the eighth day. And so it would be the safest time to perform that kind of operation. In 1947, in a cave in a cliff on the west side of the Dead Sea, they found several large jars containing leather scrolls. These were the Dead Sea Scrolls. They've been carefully sealed and preserved in their jars for over 1,900 years. Coins found inside the jars and paleographers date the scrolls at 125 BC. Until that time, the earliest biblical manuscripts were about 900 AD. The Isaiah scroll, about 125 BC, matched precisely with the text of Isaiah dated in 916 AD. That's a thousand years of copy after copy, translation after translation with complete accuracy. And this proves that the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus were written before he came to earth and not after. And Isaiah and the rest of the Old Testament have a lot to say about the first coming of the Messiah. They said that he would be born of a virgin, that he'd be born in Bethlehem, that he would be a man of sorrows. And there are many other predictions of a second coming of Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 22, if he didn't shorten those days, no human flesh would be saved. How would that be possible 200 years ago? It wouldn't. Maybe this is the reason you have pictures like this. This was a color picture of a French nuclear test in 1969. You can see our Lord on the cross and our Blessed Mother right next to him, all in white, as Our Lady of Grace. The Holy House of Loretto is believed to be the house where the Holy Family lived. And it was originally in Nazareth and was actually picked up and moved and placed in Yugoslavia. And then from there it went to Loretto, Italy, where it is today. And they've found these places in Nazareth and Yugoslavia and they checked the area of the foundation and it's exactly the same to the Holy House of Loretto, Italy, the same area foundation. It's the exact same size. In fact, you can go over to Loretto, Italy and visit the Holy House and you'll find that the house still doesn't rest on a foundation up until this day. This is a St. Joseph staircase. In New Mexico, there are sisters that needed a staircase built from the choir loft that went basically straight up and down. And they asked carpenters to help them, and no one could help them. And so they put it in the hands of St. Joseph. They made a novena to St. Joseph. And on the last day of the novena, a man came, and he said he could help the, the sisters with building the staircase. And this is the staircase. It consists of exactly 33 steps. There are two complete 360 degree turns. There's no supporting pull up the center. This means that it hangs there with no support. The entire weight is on the base. And some architects have said by all laws of gravity, it should have crashed to the floor the minute anyone stepped on it. And yet it has been daily used for nearly 100 years. It rests against a loft at the top and the floor at the bottom where the entire weight appears to be supported. Wooden pegs rather than nails are used throughout. And the railing was not part of the original construction, but added two years later. There are no nails or screws in any part of it, nor are there any steel plates or angle irons. There's only wood and wooden pegs throughout. Furthermore, the wood appears to be of a hard variety, and according to some wood authorities, it is not a native wood of New Mexico, and where it was obtained is still a mystery. 
On December 9, 1531, there was a Mexican peasant named Juan Diego traveling to go to church, and the Blessed Mother appeared to him and told him that she wanted a chapel built where she was appearing and that he should go and tell the bishop and give him this message. So he went and told the bishop. The bishop asked uh, Juan Diego to tell the lady for a, to give him a sign so that he would know that this was of God. So he went back and told our Blessed Mother that the bishop wanted a sign. And so our Blessed Mother told him to gather up some roses and put them in his cloak and his tilma and present these roses to the bishop. But wasn't it wintertime? Yes, and that's another miracle about it. These roses shouldn't have been growing in the winter. So he got these roses, put them in his tilma, went to the bishop, he presented them to the bishop, and the image of Guadalupe appeared on his tilma. This is the incredible image of Guadalupe. It's been subjected to rains, floods, earthquakes. In 1921, someone placed a bomb underneath it. It exploded, but the image remained intact. The tilma is made of a vegetable matter that normally deteriorates after 50 years. It should have rotted centuries ago. The materials used to produce what resembles colors are unknown to science. There is no evidence of an undersketch on the painting. There is no underdrawing. There is no sizing. And without sizing, it makes it at least humanly impossible to paint on its rough surface. There is no protective over-varnish, and without protective varnishing, the picture should have been ruined long ago by the prolonged exposure to candle smoke and other pollutants. There is no fading or cracking, incredible when you consider it's been there for almost 475 years. The balanced placement of the stars is not an accident, at least not according to astronomers. The stars correspond to 46 stars and 14 constellations, as they are in the positions of the early morning sky on December 12th. And December 12th was the day our Blessed Mother imprinted her image on the tilma. In recent years, the eyes have been subject of considerable scientific research. By using computer technology and amplifying the eyes up to 2,500 times the normal 7 to 8 millimeter size, researchers have found what appears to be the portrait of Juan Diego in the right eye. And just between 1532 and 1548, uh, you had 9 million that converted in Mexico to the Catholic faith. So we lost 5 million due to the Reformation in Europe, but we almost doubled that amount in Mexico. And 20 million come from all over the world to see the image of Guadalupe. In 1917, our Blessed Mother appeared to three little children, Lucia de Santos and Francisco and Jacinta Marto. She asked the people to pray the rosary, and she showed the little children a vision of hell. The little children wanted a miracle performed by the Blessed Mother. They asked her for this miracle so that all the people would believe that she was appearing. So our Blessed Mother said she would work a miracle and it would be on October 13th at noon in 1917. And so it was the first time actually since the resurrection that a miracle has been predicted to take place at a certain time and place. And so the people came on October the 13th, 75 to 100,000 persons, up to their ankles in mud and atheists were there, skeptics, masons, uh, to mock the miracle when they thought it wouldn't happen. But then at 12 noon, the miracle did happen. The sun started to make movements outside the laws of nature, and it started to spin on its side for about 12 minutes. And then after 12 minutes, it started to plunge towards the earth, and everyone thought it was the end of the world. And then right when it was about to hit the earth, it went back to its normal position in the sky sick were cured during this miracle and there's a second miracle because the clothes and the ground were dry one engineer took a look and he said the amount of energy you would need to dry all the clothes in the ground it would take a 10 megaton bomb he says and if that happened all the people would be burned to death our blessed mother at Fatima predicted that Russia would spread its errors throughout the world and at that time Russia was the third weakest country in the whole world she mentioned that another worse war would begin in the reign of Pius XI. Pius XI wasn't even Pope at that time. She mentioned that you would know that God was about to punish the world when you saw a night illuminated by an unknown light. And that light, that great light, was seen on January 25, 1938. It illuminated the skies of Europe. It was a red glow that was seen for about five hours all over Europe, so much so that the people in Switzerland at 11 p.m. at night could read their newspapers. And the only way that mankind can reproduce this is by an atomic explosion. And basically, when that strange night illuminated by an unknown light happened, it was 47 days after that that Hitler invaded Austria. And Our Lady said that she would try to prevent these uh, punishments, that she would ask for the Pope and you with all the bishops throughout the world to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. She asked for the third secret to be revealed at the latest in 1960. That has not happened. She asked for the communions of reparation on the first Saturdays of the month. And the little seer Jacinta 
after she died, her body was exhumed in 1951, and it was found to still be intact, perfectly incorrupt. And there have been many hundreds of bodies that have remained perfectly intact, perfectly incorrupt. One is Catherine Labore, and she saw our Blessed Mother, and our Blessed Mother gave her the medal that Catholics wear called the Miraculous Medal. Thousands of miracles have been attributed to it. She died in 1876, and her body is perfectly incorrupt. Bernadette Subaru, she saw apparitions of the Blessed Mother in Lourdes, France, where millions come each year to pray. Countless miracles have occurred. And Bernadette died in 1879, and her body remains perfectly incorrupt. Not only bodies, but also scapulars have remained intact. St. Alphonsus, he died in 1787. His body and clothes turned into dust, but his brown scapular remained perfectly intact. In fact, examination proved that it had no special treatment. This is a brown scapular given by our Blessed Mother to St. Simon Stock in 1251. Thousands of miracles have been attributed to this brown scapular. There are over something like 16,000 canonized saints in the Catholic Church. And for each saint, each person that becomes a saint, they need miracles. And these aren't just simple miracles. These have to be verifiable miracles. And doctors testify, people testify. And the Catholic Church is very careful before it makes anyone a saint. And the Catholic Church is the only church with an uninterrupted history of miracles from the beginning of the Catholic Church throughout all of human history. In fact, St. Vincent Ferrer, he converted almost 200,000 people to the Catholic faith, raised over 30 people from the dead, and worked an estimated 40,000 miracles during his life. And when he was canonized, made a saint, almost a thousand miracles were used in his canonization. Padre Pio is another mystic of our times. He also had the stigmata. He died in 1968. He had the stigmata visibly for 50 years. Padre Pio had many gifts. He could tell you when you went to confession last, your whole life, your sins. He was seen throughout the world. Uh, he's worked thousands of miracles that already fill something like 54 volumes. And since his death in 1968, he's continued to work miracles. But one of the most interesting miracles during his life was of a woman named Gemma de Giorgia, who's from Italy and is now about 40. Gemma was born without pupils and still has no pupils, and she went with her grandmother to see Padre Pio and asked for a cure, and Padre Pio blessed Gemma, and she can see. She can still see right now, and she still has no pupils in her eyes, and it's anatomically impossible to see without pupils, and yet she can see as well as anyone with normal eyesight. We also have exorcisms on audio tape, and if people don't believe in the devil, they should get some of our exorcism tapes, and not only the Exorcism tapes prove the existence of the devil, but they show how powerful devotion is to the Mother of God, how much the devil hates the rosary. You hear it all in these audio tapes, and we hope to have videotape of exorcisms in the future. There have been many Eucharistic miracles. Non-Catholic churches do not believe at the words of consecration by a Catholic priest that the bread and wine change into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And there have been many hundreds of Eucharistic miracles throughout the last 2,000 years. And this just verifies the Catholic belief. And this is very essential, of course, because we know what our Lord says in John 6:53, Amen, amen, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you cannot have everlasting life in you. So this is a very important issue. But in Lanciano, in 700 AD, there was a priest who doubted whether he was really consecrating the bread and wine and the true body, blood, and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. And at the moment of consecration, the bread and wine changed into the actual, visibly, the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And scientists have tested this, and they've tested this flesh, and they found that this flesh was human flesh. The blood is human blood, and the blood type of the flesh and blood is AB. And if you were to cut yourself and bleed and stain your shirt, within 15 minutes you lose all the chemical qualities of blood. And if you give blood, when they put it in plastic bags, if they don't refrigerate that blood within one hour, it begins to break down. You have nothing but red liquid. But they took a particle of the petrified blood and liquefied it during these tests, and they found it had all the proteins and chemicals of freshly shed blood 1,300 years old. And during these tests, when they tested the slice of the heart, rigor mortis had not set in, and it was determined that the slice of the heart was a living heart. Another miracle was in Siena in 1730, there were thieves that broke into a church and they stole a, a ciborium among other things, but they left the ciborium with 351 hosts somewhere down the road. 
they recovered the ciborium with the 351 hosts. They didn't consume the hosts, and they still have these hosts. They're from 1730, and they still have not decomposed. And this is incredible. In Kasi, in 1300, there was a farmer who needed the last sacraments from the priest, and he called the priest. The priest went out on a sick call, but instead of taking the host and putting it in a pix, he threw it in between the pages of a book. And so when he prepared the man for the farmer for Holy Communion, he opened the book, and instead of the host being in between the book, there was a blood stain on the page of the book. So this is a miracle in and of itself. But if you, you can go to the church in Cassia, and you can see the page of this book with the blood stain, but if you look inside the blood stain, you can see the profile of Jesus. You can see his hair, his eyes, his nose, and his beard. The Shroud of Turin is claimed to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. Scoffers are trying to say that it's a medieval fraud, it's a fake. But it's well documented that the Shroud existed before the Middle Ages. Here's a brief history. The Shroud was carried from the tomb of Jesus by Peter and taken to Edessa, Turkey. The Shroud was lost and wasn't rediscovered till 944 when a Byzantine emperor sent an army to bring it to Constantinople. In 1204, the European Knights of the Fourth Crusade sacked Constantinople. They took it back to France, where Margaret de Charnay transferred it to the Savoy family. In 1532, a fire in the Savoy Cathedral in Chambéry, France, damaged the shroud. And in 1578, the Savoys established their capital in Turin, Italy, and took the shroud with them, where it remains today. And in spite of the overwhelming evidence which you're about to see, there's only two points that these scoffers try to bring up to disprove the Shroud of Turin. One is the carbon tests that were done in 1988, and the other is a reputed letter from a Bishop Darcy. And this reputed letter said that this bishop wrote this letter that he knew who made the shroud or forged the shroud. He knew the artist. That's what this letter was all about, and that's what they're trying to claim. Proves that the shroud is a fake or uh, a fraud. That, that doesn't prove it at all. In fact, the, this reputed bishop of Darcy letter has never been proven genuine. None of the copies of the Darcy letter are signed or dated. There's no proof that the pope ever saw it or that it was ever delivered to him. In fact, Pope Clement VII allowed the shroud to be exposed to the public during this whole time. There's no evidence that it's in the handwriting of the bishop it's purported or claimed to be. It's simply estimated that it's from 1389. The artist or forger is not even named. There's no official transcript of any official investigation. The first photographs of the shroud were taken by Segunda P. in 1898. And he was shocked to find when he took the pictures that the negative image was a positive image. And Barry Schwartz, who is actually Jewish, He's the shroud documenting photographer. He says this, quote, Assuming that the shroud were manufactured in the 14th century, it would mean that someone would have had to conceive the concept of photography approximately 650 years before it was invented. I don't think so, end quote. Some of these scourge marks on the shroud appear only under ultraviolet light, which means that the forger would have to paint the marks so that they'd be invisible to the naked eye and then discern that ultraviolet equipment be invented some 650 years later. That's impossible. There's not a trace of paint pigment on the shroud. There are no brush strokes. The images on the shroud are directionless and therefore could not be painted, at least not by a human hand. Kevin Moran, optical engineer, says this, quote, the shroud image is made from tiny fibers that are one-tenth the size of a human hair. The picture elements are actually randomly distributed like the dots in your newspaper photograph or magazine photograph. To do this, you would need an incredibly accurate atomic laser. This technology does not exist." End quote. And also, if uh, someone was to paint the shroud, they would have to have a 20-foot long brush because the image isn't even discernible much closer than that. They also found blood on the Shroud of Turin. According to medical physicist Dr. John Heller and blood specialist Dr. Alan Adler, they found not only the markings on the shroud were blood, but blood highly loaded with bilirubin, a bile pigment that would only show up if a dead man had been severely or traumatically beaten. And pathologist Pierre Ballone came to the further conclusion that the blood spots were human blood and of the type AB. In fact, there are 13 tests that confirm that blood was on the shroud. The image on the shroud is negative, but the blood marks are positive. The blood marks on the shroud have remained red, and why it hasn't darkened by time and oxidation is unexplainable. At the back of the toes on the shroud, there's an original bleeding when the man was alive, and then in the tomb, there was a renewed bleeding. 
So two blood flows, and, and this is impossible for someone to forge. In fact, the experts were shocked by the way the blood evidence was transferred to the shroud. It was done perfectly without one smear, which practically, humanly speaking, is impossible. Dr. Max Fry was a Swiss criminologist. He was one of the leading experts in dust and pollen analysis in the whole world. In fact, he single-handedly developed a technique to determine where criminals had been by testing samples of dust and pollen from their clothing. And he was consulted on many crimes by police forces of many nations. Dr. Fry's objective was very simple. If the shroud was forged in France in the 14th century, then only the French or Italian pollens will be found in the cloth. But his exhaustive analysis found some 58 specific pollens, only 17 were native to Europe. The rest were from Palestine and southern Turkey, the site of Edessa and Constantinople. And this meant that the shroud had been in these places at some time in its history. In fact, 13 of the pollens come exclusively from Palestine and are growing in Israel today. Professor Ray Zelovain found in the shroud linen microscopic bits of cotton under the microscope. And not just plain cotton, but cotton with a certain number of twists per centimeter. We have to realize that cotton has a, a different number of twists per centimeter depending upon what country it's from. And cotton grown over here, for example, has 20 to 25 twists. And cotton grown over in the Middle East has 8 to 10 twists. And the cotton found in the shroud has about 8 twists per centimeter. So it fits exactly the kind of cotton that's in the Middle East. And cotton isn't even grown commercially in Europe. They found on the shroud many highly accurate images of many flowers, many hundreds of these, 28 specific flowers they found to a good degree of accuracy. That all these flowers, what's important about these flowers, they all grow in Jerusalem or within 12 miles of Jerusalem. So whatever produced the image on the shroud also produced a high energy field producing many images of every object that was in the shroud itself and hence we have a highly accurate image of these flowers. They've also found dirt on the footprint of the cloth. And this dirt has been found to come from Jerusalem's Damascus Gate and nowhere else. And they found three-dimensional information in the Shroud of Turin. And this is incredible because we have to realize that a painting or photograph only has two-dimensional information, height and width. And the Shroud has been found to have 3D information. And they put it under a special machine called the VP8 Analyzer. And the VP8 analyzer found that in the shroud image there is encoded three-dimensional information which an artist could not have put there. It's also a Jewish custom when people die to put coins over the eyes uh, when laying the corpse out for burial. And in the test that they did examining the shroud turn, it looks like there's a coin over one of the eyes, the right eye. And this coin has 24 coincidences with a coin called the lepton, which was put out by Pontius Pilate between 29 and 36 AD. And when you look at this coin, you notice the staff. Remember the staff and the letters UKAI. And now we're going to look at the shroud, reproducing it closer and closer, larger and larger. And under high magnification, a father Phylus found this. You can see the staff and the letters UCAI. And Father Phylus was shocked to see this. And, but he wondered why there was a C instead of a K. But in 1981, at the British Museum, he found two coins that had a C instead of a K. So this information would throw forging completely out of the question. Father Phylus said, quote, even the wildest imagination cannot now justify any claim that the tiny letters 1 32nd of an inch could have been printed on the cloth. Other features that prove the authenticity of the shroud. The locks on the side of the face is a Jewish custom. The body on the shroud is not even straight. The abdomen appears swollen, showing that the cause of death was suffocation. The legs on the shroud are not broken, and the Romans who crucified their victims always broke the legs of the crucified. And this goes back to Exodus 1246, where it says that they wouldn't break a bone in his body. The blood flows, we have to realize that when you're crucified, the hands fall to a 25-65 degree angle, and so the blood flows a certain way. And it's exactly the blood flows on the shroud show that it was of a man who was crucified. In fact, studying the photos of the shroud caused Dr. Pierre Barberi, chief surgeon of the St. Joseph Hospital in Paris, France, to say this, quote, If this is the work of a forger, then the forger would have to be a trained anatomist, for there is not a single blunder. Basically, you also have when a nail pierces the median nerve in the wrist, the thumb goes automatically into the palm, and that's what's shown on the shroud. 
And this wouldn't invalidate the prophecy, they have pierced my hands and my feet, I can count on my bones, because anatomists in all countries and throughout history have understood the hand to consist of the wrist, the palm, and the fingers. This is a picture of a Roman scourging device called the flagrum. And you'll notice it consists of a handle onto which are three leather strips that are attached. And each of these leather strips have a dumbbell-shaped object attached, metal object. And this device was used by the Romans as a means of punishing an individual by beating his body with stripes. And if you look at the size of the dumbbell-shaped object on the end of the flagrum, it fits perfectly into the wounds on the shroud. One author wrote that there are 120 scourge wounds on the Shroud of Turin, and Jewish law limited the number of lashes to 40, and 40 times 3 is 120. The wound in the side of the Shroud measures 1 and 3 fourths inches by 7 sixteenths of an inch, which exactly corresponds to the size of the tip of the Roman spear called the Lamea. It's also called the Spear of Longinus, and it's kept in the Habsburg Treasure House in Vienna, Austria, and legend has it that this is the spear that pierced the side of Jesus, and it was owned by Longinus, a Roman soldier assigned to duty at the crucifixion site by Pontius Pilate. Now, what's interesting is uh, that Hitler believed this legend, and he visited the Habsburg Treasure House when he was 19. When he invaded Austria at the very beginning of World War II, he took the spear because he believed that he had to have the spear to go out and conquer the world. Going back to the anatomy of the shroud, the buttocks is rigid with rigor mortis, and some scientists have said that this shroud, whoever was covered in the shroud, has been dead not more than 40 hours. A forensic pathologist from Los Angeles County, Dr. Robert Buckland, finishes his analysis of the shroud by saying, quote, the evidence of a scourge man who was crucified and died of suffocation is clear cut. The markings on this body are so clear and so medically accurate that they are, in my opinion, beyond dispute. And the other question is, why would anyone keep this kind of relic, so gruesome a relic, unless it was the true burial cloth of Jesus Christ? But Shroud advocates suffered a serious setback when the carbon-14 dates came back in 1988, where it said that these, the Shroud was from 1260 to 1390. And, but C-14 is far from an exact science. In fact, freshly killed mollusks show that they've been dead for 3,000 years, while bristlecone pine, the oldest trees on Earth, always date too young by two to 3,000 years. Evolutionist William Stansfield said this, quote, there is no absolutely reliable long-term radiological clock. And so C14 dating is based on a number of assumptions, such as that, that the rate of decay has always been the same throughout history. The amount of C14 in the atmosphere is the same as it always has been is also based on the assumption that the geologic column is correct, and we've proved that that is not correct. Three labs were selected to perform the shroud carbon-14 test. They were given three linen control samples, samples of a known age, to test the accuracy of their lab testing. One sample was known to be from 3000 BC, and when the test came back from the three labs, their numbers were off by 1100 years, and the tester defended these errors due to contamination of the samples, but after extensive retesting, the sample was still found to be 1,100 years off. And so there are too many variables that it can affect test results, and beside, the shroud sample takers and their labs violated 14 scientific protocols that were established to ensure test accuracy. And also, these labs carried out their tests by consulting one another. And Secretary of State Casseroli, who was rumored to be a Freemason, gave supervising responsibility for the carbon-14 tests to research director of the British Museum, Dr. Michael Tithe. So it's strange that Cardinal Casseroli would give the supervising of the reputed burial cloth of Jesus Christ to his declared enemies. And what's interesting is Dr. Tithe wrote a letter to Jacques Even, director of the radiocarbon laboratory at the University of Lyon. And he asked for a cloth, him to find him a cloth, similar to the Holy Shroud in every detail. And so Jacques Yvan looked around, he found a cloth that was very similar to the Shroud of Turin, made at the end of the 13th century. And Dr. Tithe denied writing this letter to Jacques Yvan until his letter was published, and then he admitted it. So what they did was, when they did this test, they cut off a little piece from the actual Shroud of Turin. And this was all done before video cameras on April 21st, 1988. And the three men involved were Dr. Michael Tithe of the British Museum Laboratory, Cardinal Anastasio Balestrio, the custodian of the Shroud of Turin, who, by the way, 
even before the carbon-14 test, said he didn't believe the shroud was authentic. He said it was similar to a holy painting. And Professor Luigi Ganella, the Archbishop's science advisor, and so they cut the piece off the Shroud of Turin, and then these three men went to a separate room where no video cameras could go. No one could go. And what these three men did in this half an hour that they were by themselves with the piece of the Shroud of Turin, no one knows because these men have never told anyone what happened during these 30 minutes. And it becomes apparent, though, that there is a substitution of cloths. And the size of the cloth that the labs tested, the three labs where these, this piece of shroud was sent to, is not the same that was cut from the shroud. And for some reason, the Tucson lab received two shroud samples. At first, everyone denied this, and then later, everyone admitted it. In fact, we can't get the samples that they tested because in carbon-14 dating, the samples are destroyed. The chief tester at Zurich, Switzerland, Dr. Wolfie, he stated publicly, even before these tests, that he thought the shroud was a fake. So all these people that were involved, or most of them, seemed to not believe in the shroud anyway. So and they had a bias agenda to find that the shroud was a fake. And so that's what they were looking exactly, to Exactly. That's the way it looks. And when these supposed results came back from the three labs, that it was between 1260 and 1390, Professor Ed T. Hall and Dr. Tithe of the British Museum held their own press conference and written in large numbers on a blackboard behind them were the supposed results, punctuated by an exclamation point, 1260 to 1390. The London Daily Telegraph of March 26, 1989 tells us of some of the possible motives. They reported on Good Friday, March 25, 1989, 45 businessmen and rich friends presented to Professor Ed T. Hall of Oxford one million pounds notable for his services in having determined last year that the Shroud of Turin was a medieval fake. Hall said that he was using the funds to create a new chair of archaeology science at Oxford to be filled with Dr. Michael Tithe. So Dr. Hall assisted Dr. Tithe in the crime by providing him with a chair at Oxford as a reward for his work in defrauding the people of the world of the greatest religious relic of all time. And so if the shroud is reproducible, why doesn't someone reproduce it? No one can. The skeptics cannot reproduce it. And the shroud shows very clearly that Jesus Christ lived, Jesus Christ died, and Jesus Christ rose again. So I've shown throughout this whole video that not only God exists, but the Catholic faith is the true faith. And it's one thing to realize what I'm saying. It's another thing to act upon it. And I say someone that's truly concerned, that truly cares, as a convert to the Catholic faith, that if you don't embrace the Catholic faith, you'll be lost for all eternity. And if you are a Catholic, pray the rosary, wear the brown scapular, stay in a state of grace, fulfill your state of life. And the evidence is before you, the miracles, the proof. So if you look at the early church fathers, they believe in the Mass, they believe in the Eucharist, they believed in all Catholic teachings. And that's what the true faith was, and that's what the true faith still is today. People want to talk about the Bible, the Catholic Church decided what books were to be in the Bible. And the Catholic Church has told us on all issues what we must believe and not believe, what is sin, what is not, what will send us to hell, and what things we must believe to gain eternal life. And if I go to any of these non-Catholic churches and ask them, what must I believe? They'll point to the Bible. But the problem is, what passages do I take literally? Which do I take figuratively? And basically, if the Holy Ghost leads all people to interpret the Bible, how come you have tens of thousands of different Protestant churches all believing different things about the Bible? And none of them claim to be infallible. And so who settles a dispute? Who hands down a decision? Or has handed down a decision? Or they'll say, just believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Well, Matthew 7.21 says, Not all that say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, he shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And no, we don't believe in Jesus unless we accept and follow all that He has commanded. And this theory, once saved, always saved, you can never lose your salvation, that isn't even biblical. St. Paul says in Philippians 2.13 to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says in 1 Corinthians 9.27, he says, when I'm preaching to the faithful, I fear that I myself may become a castaway. And so he talks about salvation is running a race to the end. If where you're going to spend all eternity uh, doesn't concern you or doesn't interest you, isn't high in the list of your priorities, well, you're definitely going to go into the fires of hell. And once you arrive there, there's no escape. Your eternity is fixed, and you'll burn and weep and suffer and be tortured by demons for all eternity. 
And God doesn't want that to happen. He says in 1 Timothy 2.4 that He wishes for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And what you have heard on this tape is the truth. And if people think what I'm saying is, is very foolish, then you can always say to them, what are you going to be doing in 200 years from now? We'll all be dead and forgotten. And everyone you did know on earth will be dead and forgotten. And your body will be six feet under the earth, and your soul will be in purgatory in heaven or burning in the fires of hell for all eternity. Basically, this is reality. That's why our Lord says in Matthew 16, 26, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? That's why he says in Matthew 6.33 to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his justice and all things will be added on to you. That's why Genesis 3.19 says, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. That's why Ecclesiasticus 7 verse 40 says, remember your last end and you will never sin. Basically, no matter what way you look at it, your time is running out and no one can promise you another year, another month, another week, another hour, or even another breath. And so, if you don't want to spend all eternity burning in the fires of hell, embrace the true Catholic faith, keep the faith, and may you hold it to your dying breath.